Good evening. I have this Leo voice, so I don't know how the amplification is going to help it uh, that much, but uh, I'd like to uh, say that it's a pleasure for my person to meet and be among all of you who are looking at this whole history of the uh, Underground Railroad and the struggle uh, for freedom on the part of our enslaved ancestors and foreparents in America. Uh, my person is based in Natchez, Mississippi, and I spend most of my time for the last 18 years working on a site called the Forks of the Road. It was the second largest enslavement Deep South Americans domestic, that is within America's boundary, enslavement selling market uh, for enslaved Africans who were captured and brought down south on the Overground Railroad uh, from Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, uh, Virginia, the Carolinas, and et cetera, in order to help make King Cotton, uh, Queen Sugar, and also Princess Rice and some uh, Prince Tobacco crops, cash crops. Uh, what I've done is to, cho to choose this site at the forks of the road as a common denominator for the proliferated uh, tourism industry that exists in Natchez and other parts of Mississippi where they treat our ancestors as if they were aliens. They talk about the, 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 the marble, the, the building, or the, the culture of the Europeans and slavery, but, and then they say the slaves as if we were some kind of aliens. Our humanity is not, uh, reckon you know that story. So anyway, I uh, chose this site as an equalizer to that. So I spent many, many years uh, of the last 18 years working on trying to advocate and bring that site into preservation, what have you. And I'd like to specifically thank the members of the Underground Railroad Network, the Freedom Program, for funding or helping to get funds, especially through Barbara Tiger uh, and the Lower Mississippi Delta Initiative Fund for two traveling exhibits and a brochure that uh, you could have picked up back there and is still available about the forks of the road and also a small grant for a research project to kill the myth that the Underground Railroad was mainly a to the north, from the south to the north, uh, to Canada type of phenomenon. Uh, my project title was proving that the Mississippi River was a major Underground Railroad Uhuru route, uh, freedom route from Memphis to the Gulf of Mexico. And I spent a number of years traveling from Memphis to the Gulf of Mexico and other places, looking at the records, looking at the uh, newspaper ads and et cetera, and you can see very clearly our people resisted slavery in the Deep South with their feet. The jails and the newspaper were littered with their uh, 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 records of their running away. And one of the persons that also helped me greatly for getting the information once I started to focus on, well, what did our people do to help free us? Because the myth said that they would be free, uh, enslaved forever. And we come to find out that number one, when they did get into the South and even before, they hit the ground running and uh, ran in all four directions. But when we got to the Civil War, here we see this movement going where uh, the blue brother, the brother in the blue coat and gray coat are fighting each other. And so I'm in the Mississippi Valley where you don't get much, you know, you get all that Eastern stuff, Petersburg, Gettysburg, and all those other burgs. And you get that kind of history. And so uh, what did we do in the Mississippi Valley? Well, after July 4, when the Confederates surrendered in Vicksburg, 1863, five days later, they surrendered at Port Hudson, Louisiana. Our ancestors ran away in the Mississippi Valley from both sides of the river by the thousand. They self-emancipated, okay? That means they abandoned their places of enslavement and sought freedom uh, wherever the Union occupied and other places where they hid out until they could get to the Union. Uh, I'm going to share with you, oh, oh, the person that helped me with all of that, I couldn't because you've already honored it, but I have to understand, have you understand that on my website and all of the documents, the books that I've compiled to try to publish and what have you, about uh, Civil War and, and the U.S. Colored Truth, African, uh, African descended folks in the Mississippi Valley, those reports, most of them comes from Nana Benny McRae, and I give him the title Nana because that's a Canadian West African title for elder 
Uh, my title is Sir, and it's an ancient Egyptian title for ever elder. You know, walk that walk and done that talk. And so Benny sends all of this information to me, and we have something called a black and blue civil war uh, living history. That is, we bring alive the stories and, and what have you of the uh, of some of these runaways and what our thousands of people did along uh, the Mississippi River in the Freedom Summer of 1863 when they ran away to be free. Glaringly absent from the vast amount of extent documented information about the Underground Railroad is substantial compilation showing actual Underground Railroad related escapes, runaways, maroon communities, uprising, revolts, rebellions, conspiracies, resistance, defiance, and uncivil war double victories, and other freedom stories in the Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee. We're getting a little bit of Arkansas this time, this trip here. Thus the need to study and compile definitive evidence and databases showing the Mississippi River was indeed a major underground railroad escape and freedom route from Memphis, to Tennessee, Memphis Tennessee to the Gulf of Mexico. The underground railroad story is perceived as a north to northeast story and a very unbalanced as the United States historical story. It's very unbalanced. My research project addressed the existing need for specific documentation of information about the underground related story, underground railroad related stories, escapes, runaways, maroons, communities, uprising, revolts, rebellions, conspiracies, resistance, defiance, uncivil war, absconding, absconding, uh, support, military activity, and double victories in the deep south along the Mississippi River. Underground railroad publications by the National Park Service and other sources contain little specific stories and information of underground railroad activities in the deep southwest. By focusing research along the Mississippi River, I successfully obtained solid documentation that the network can verifiably, quantifiably, and explicitly amend its current underground railroad program to tell the stories of all that resistance, escaping, defiance, and et cetera in the Deep South. <coughs> Professor Edward Baptiste called this action by enslaved ancestors who ran away for the Civil War and participated as freedom fighters as the greatest slave rebellion in the history of the United States. So let's look at some of those, just a couple of them. Uh, first, I would call attention to Laura Haviland. Uh, you can pick a book up and get it on the internet or through the library, A Woman's Life Work. This was an abolitionist from Michigan who came down to Mississippi uh, and uh, Tennessee and Louisiana as part of some relief effort during the Civil War. But while she was at Memphis, she said, I met an old runaway slave woman who had escaped from a plantation along with six other freedom-seeking men. That their overseer thought he had whipped the Yankee out of them, he thought. I approached the young men who were between 20 and, tw and 30 years old and shook hands with them saying, it seems your overseer didn't succeed in whipping the Yankee out of you night before last. No, indeed, said one, he drove the Yankees in deeper every lick. And another said, I reckon he'll find out this morning how much Yankee he whipped out of us. This is a story of Phyllis Reed, and in my Black and Blue Civil War events, I write scripts when we can find the basic data and facts, historical correct, Park Service. Uh, we then, I, I add, I, I bring them alive through, through script writing and then have people do role play. And this is for a female, and since, uh, you know, we ain't going there. I ain't definitely, well, I'm Phyllis Reed, wife of Danny Reed. We belong to Master Samuel Darden in Jefferson County for the walk. In the 1850s, old Master Darden gave his okay for me at age 15 to marry Daniel. My name was Phyllis Davis before we married. Master Darden also gave the okay for Daniel's brother James to marry Louisa. A slave preacher married us all when the Union Army took over Natchez. In the summer of 1863, my husband Daniel and his brother James, their uncle and me, we all leave Master Darden plantations in Jefferson County, us and come to Natchez and join up with the Union Army. Daniel and Jane Reed, along with the two cousins, join the 58 Colored Infantry, and they earn $10 a month. Let's see, that is $7 each in cash and $3 worth of them soldiers' clothes. Their uncle drove a wagon for the regimental hospital in Natchez, 
my husband Daniel and them joined the Union Army at that slave trader's yard yonder at the forks of the road of Washington and Liberty Roads. Both Daniel and his brother James died from the smallpox in early 1864. I took to nursing my husband till he died. Then I come to be a nurse after he died. I got paid $10 each. This was the official army pay for military laborers, nurses, teamsters, laundries, cooks, and then men building the fortification. This is Burl Lewis from Natchez at Brown Sawmill. I am Burl Lewis. I was brought from Virginia to Natchez by 1857. I was born in William Burris County, Virginia, in a place they call Hickory Fork. When the slave trader brought me to Natchez, I was sold to Andrew Brown and put to work at Brown Sawmill under the hill on the river. When the war come, a slave watched old Master Brown run a Confederate flag up the pole on top of his mill. He was plenty strong for them Confederates, and after them Yankees take New Orleans in 1862, when the Federal gunboat come near Natchez, he take down that Confederate flag. No sooner the gunboat gone, he didn't run that flag up again. But when the fighting at Vicksburg started, he take down that flag and he keep it down for good. When Union Army took Natchez in July 1863, they take over Brown Sawmill. One day a Union officer come ask Brown for some lumber, but Brown don't want to give him some. Next thing the officer come back with more soldiers and took Brown's lumber. Brown plenty mad, but he can't do nothing to us no more. I stayed and watched the Union Guard start taking Brown lumber. Then I got away from Brown sawmill once and for all. I was one of the first volunteers to go to go up the hill to town. So soon, several more slaves from Brown, and just like I did, they joined the 58 U.S. Colored Infantry. I joined the 58 out there at them folks of the road. The next one is, I couldn't find the script that I've written for uh, JT Tim, but quickly we'll tell you about JT Tim, and then I have one more, Diane. Uh, JT Tim uh, is interviewed uh, by the WPA uh, interviews, and he's 86 years old, and he's up in, uh, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, really. And he's telling the story. You can see it in the Mississippi narrative. No, the Arkansas narratives, I guess. And he tells it that he's born in Jefferson County, Mississippi. But one day, he is out in the yard. He's a little boy. And uh, he's uh, on the uh, Blunt Stewart. He's on the Stewart Plantation in Jefferson County. Blunt Stewart's wife, Ann, comes out. Uh, one day, she's upset about the war. And JT is just out playing. And she decides she's going to whip him for some reason. She puts JT head between his legs and starts whipping on him. He bites her and she screams and all that. You know, you can get all that in that history. It's about five or six, seven people in this particular script when they carry it out. So uh, she gets mad and she calls for an enslaved person to come whip JT. Uh, JT uh, is, is about to get whipped. His name is William. And JT's mother's the cook. She's in the kitchen, and she looks at it. William is about to hit the boy. She runs out with a, with, a, with a butcher knife. You better not hit that boy. That's my child. I'll kill you. And so then Anna Stewart calls for her son, uh, uh, oh, Turley. Turley comes here and whip uh, Ann and, 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 and JT for me. So Turley comes in and he says, I really know y'all ain't done nothing much, but uh, I got to hit you a few licks to satisfy mom. And so uh, that happens. And then later on, Blunt Stewart, uh, I mean, uh, Daniel, the father of, of, of JT and the, and the husband of, uh, of Ann, who is also Anna in the kitchen, comes and he's a shoemaker. So he's making shoes and from across the river comes Blunt Stewart, the great plantation master, and he comes in to where Daniel's making shoes. Daniel, you looking mighty gloom today. And Daniel said, you'd be looking gloom too if your folks and wife and son done been whipped and ain't done nothing. And uh, then Blunt says, what you say? He picks up a hammer and hit Daniel beside the head. And Daniel said, you better not do that again. I don't know if I can, but I'll whoop your ass. And so later that night, Daniel makes a decision. 
when he calls his people together and say, we are going to get away from here. We're not going to have this happen again. So they gather together the family and some other people on the Stewart Plantation, and they run off to Rodney, Mississippi, where the gunboats is trying to get on the gunboat. And of course, it's too dangerous uh, for them to get on the gunboat. And so the next choice is for them to get to Natchez. So Natchez is a day's walk away, but because they had run away, and there were other people, the Stampleys and what have you in that plantation. I get the Stampley from a, from a, a diary somebody wrote uh, from the Darton family that's in the archives of Mississippi. You see, when you're digging all this stuff, you never know where it's going to come together. So uh, there's a guy named St uh, uh, Stampley who has these dogs that they're used to run uh, chase run runaways all the time. So here goes Daniel uh, Thames and his family going along the river at night. They, 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 they run along the river at night and they sleep during the day. They take from Sunday to Sunday to get to Natchez that way. The dogs never catch up with them. And on the way from the various plantations along the river, they are helped by other enslaved. They're given food. And so they make it to Natchez. Daniel becomes a member of the 64th Colored Infantry, and the 64th was stationed at Davis Bend. Good old Jeff Davis, where there's a country band camp, and they defended that camp along with other places. And so, uh, that's basically how the, the, the Tim family became free. And I'm going to finish this up with a nurse uh, who uh, it was called Ann Stokes, and you can see Ann Stokes on the internet. My name is Ann Stokes. I was born a slave in Rutherford County, Tennessee in 1830. I was a nurse in the United States Navy. On January 1, 1863, on the same day that President Lincoln Emancipation Proclamation don't take effect, I jumped in the Yazoo River just above Vicksburg and swam out and got on a Union Navy gunboat. I joined on with the Navy as a nurse. Some folks say I was the first woman to join the United States Navy, period. Women like me that serve as nurses in the Civil War open the door for other women of all colors to come to serve in the U.S. military corps. When I had to come to be an enlisted Navy nurse, I served on that Navy hospital ship, what they call the USS Red Rover. There'd be other Negro women serving on the Red Rover. Some be cooks, washers, seamstress, and so on. Four of them sisters of the Order of the Holy Cross come on board. Us all serve under the coordination of the Western Southern Sanitation Commission, which then donated three thousand worth of three thousand dollars worth of medical equipment to the ship. That Red Rover ship is what they call the Floating Hospital. It is part of the Mississippi Squadron, one under the command of Real Admiral David Dixon Porter. A ship in the Navy, first ever hospital ship. Just after I joined the Navy as nurse, the Red Rover headed down the Mississippi River with the big Navy fleet on the expedition up the White River, that's Arkansas, while the Navy fleet be fighting to take the Confederate fort at Port Arkansas, what called Fort Heineman. Us ships stayed back at the mouth of the river and take on the wounded. Then from February in 1863, to the fall of Vicksburg in July. Our hospital ship helped support other Union forces by giving other ships the Mississippi Squadron ice and fresh meat. Us serve on some of them burial details, and some of us even go ashore when and where us needed. The Red Rover kept on serving up and down the Mississippi River while us take on the sick and the wounded. We also delivered medicine and supplies to the hospital on land where needed. Now that's the life of a few of thousands of enslaved people in the Mississippi Valley who ran away to be free in the Freedom Summer of 1863. And we bring those stories alive in period clothes and uniform annually. We're going into our sixth annual Black, Hist uh, Black and Blue Living History Program. And so it's October the 26th. Frederick Douglass from Kentucky is going to come down. But we are going to relive and tell those stories of the Freedom Summer in 1863 when our ancestors by the thousands in the Mississippi Valley on both sides of the river 
self-emancipated, running away to become freedom fighters on the side of the brothers in the blue coats. Actually, I think this Leo will work. Uh, brother man in the wheelchair, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you. What we're going to do right now is part of the program that Diane and others had planned, uh, along with the help from Harry Rose, uh, Harry Jones, and folks at the uh, African Descendant Civil War Museum in Washington have identified these names, uh, at least 500 of them, that uh, were self-emancipators. They ran away, they abandoned their places of enslavement from April 1861 onward. They've been identified as runaways. They're from the Carolinas, they're from Tennessee, they're from Mississippi, they're in the first Alabama, they're in the first and second Kansas, they're in the 55th uh, whatever becomes uh, in, in the uh, South Carolina University becomes the 55th and things like that. By looking at those names this morning, you pick this up. And what I have in terms of the libation ceremony, I want to give you a libation statement, uh, which is uh, going to have to clarify for those who don't understand uh, libation. And I have two people who are going to assist my person. And uh, if you could uh, light up the the uh, frankincense and more incense while I read this statement, then we can get on with it. But the story says a uh, plan called for you with those cards that are in the seats you're sitting on, those little cards that you now pick up from your seat and put on the table. Okay, keep it there because as part of the ceremony, you're going to be calling their energy up. You're going to be calling the name of the person whose energy uh, uh, were, 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 were runaways and what have you. But let me make a statement about libation, just in case. My, one of the, uh, the, the uh, exhibits that I have funded through the uh, Underground Railroad uh, Network Freedom Program actually was the first one. My African European roots of the Underground Railroad traveling exhibit teaches that Africans resisted to and struggle against Europeans and other foreigners, oppression, captivity, and enslavement, as well as their ongoing defiance against racism and white supremacy domination, originated in Africa. It originated in Africa. Black African descendants struggle for freedom, independence, and resistance to captivity in the Americas, originated in Africa. This struggle in the Americas came about with the first African transported in captivity through the horrible middle patches and setting foot in the new European American world. Two of the most dramatic North American expressions of African people's struggle for freedom in the human rights cycle of, of the Underground Railroad story and what has been called the greatest rebe uh, slave rebellion in history. So those are two stories that expresses this tradition of freedom that Africans always had. Africans never had a problem with freedom until strangers showed up in Africa. Our traditional DNA freedom that's on our record of having has always been in existence uh, and from the times of the Nile Valley and when the Greeks and the Hyksos and Romans and, and all those other people of the Catholics and, and, and finally the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, what have you, invaded Africa, then we start having this problem about freedom. But we've always been free. So the people who were enslaved and our ancestors in America had it already in their DNA. It wasn't a question about whether they were fight when the time came back, because they had been running away with their feet all the time. Next to God, ancestors in the African tradition are most important. One way of demonstrating this importance is through the traditional African libation offering. Uninformed folks in the Western culture have mistakenly called this tradition ancestor worship. <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> one day y'all learn it's going to 
Africans feel blessed to have those come after them who would pour libation for them. Libation is the factual evidence that Africans knew had a life before birth and life after death. Let me say that again. The libation is a scientific fact that Africans knew long before there was Christian, Arab, Judaism, Islam, any of those things, that there was life before birth and life after death. Such examples of libation offerings are copied by others as prayers, flowers on graves, candle lighting, wine cracker, and body of Christ post consumption, etc. Libation is the hundreds of thousands of years ago African spiritual sign of engaging spirits and honoring ancestors. Not the person, but the energy and light that's always was and always will be. Examples of the energy for generating electrical lights, you have a switch to turn it on, that's birth. You have a switch to turn it off, that's death. But the energy is always there. The energy and consciousness is always there, and our ancestors understood that. And it remains constant. Let us make a libation of lift every voice and sing for those who have brought us thus far on the way. I this say. libation offering is for the suffering sacrifice and contributions of enslaved African descended as ancestors and foreparents, ill-gotten and sold as human investment, investment capital. My libation water consists of waters from the Nile Valley, Egypt, Ohio, Potomac, James, Mississippi River, and from Florida, because I just had somebody recently send me some up from Florida. From Southern Africa, we have the sand from Carnival Tower at the Great Zimbabwe Temple. Gory Island in the French, you know, people say the French for, uh, you know, what is it? Human and three, my son, uh, the, 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 the my son, the ascribe, but I don't speak of the French colonial that very well. The house of the slaves in Senegal, West Africa, Cape Coast, and El Mena Fortune, and, and Ghana, just in case you don't know what they did, these are the places where these Europeans held our ancestors in captivity as captives, not as slaves. They're not enslaved until they get here in America. They have them as captives in these forts and places, okay? Uh, the sand from, uh, uh, saw from Bunch Island Fort, Sierra Leone, the Gullah the rice growers and what have and sand from Sullivan Island in South Carolina, Galveston Island in Texas, all from four directions up on the African ancestors, where the African ancestors draw. Today, we make forgotten often vibrations of frankincense and myrrh, uh, and Mississippi moonshine in the form of light to these non-self-emancipated, they ran away from the places of slave, enslaved ancestors and foreparents who voluntarily became freedom-fighting United States Civil War soldiers, cavalrymen, sailors, nurses, spies, and other kinds of supporters of the Union military during American Civil War. And so now here comes time for us. To call them out and let me do a little purification here with the frankincense and myrrh. Uh, hot, 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 hot. I'm saving y'all. Y'all know the Native American saving. Well, this is another way of purifying to make sure these brothers' spirits don't have any negative stuff that I caught up here in the hotel and other places that, that while they handle the holy water. Now, brothers, what I want you to do is use these glasses to uh, dip water and pour it into this plant. I understand the plant can withstand it. Uh, we can take this uh, bit of incense. And put it now folks, y'all ready? Y'all ready? You, you have your name. What are you going to start as they get ready with the water? You know, there's a lot of names, so uh, consider water then at the end for the, all the mass will pour the last in there. Uh, we want every, each and every one of you to start calling out a name, sing all these. And some of you have more than one name. So as uh, you call the name out, they're going to pour the offering onto this lovely concept plant. We will start at this table, and you know it's like one, two, three, four, five, two, two hundred, or whatever. Okay. Uh, John Wen. Ashe. Ashe. William Alliston. Ashe. Ashe. Thomas Wood. Ashe. Alexander Alston. Ashe. James Postwood. Ashe. Mr. Kyle Winslow. 
James Yao, Isaac Nancy, Richard White,